Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm Jeremy Druin, manager of the library's Missouri Valley Special Collections. I'd like to welcome all of you in this auditorium, as well as uh, those watching online, and, and thank you truly for supporting uh, local history programming at the library. Uh, before introducing our speaker, I want to mention that the next Missouri Valley Sunday is four weeks from today on August 6th when Kansas City Star writer Dan Kelly will be here to discuss his new book, The Girl with the Agate Eyes, The Untold Story of Maddie Howard, Kansas City's Queen of the Underworld. How, it gets better, trust me. Uh, Howard was a safe cracker and a bank robber who associated with some of the most notorious outlaws of the early 20th century. Her crime saga is a fascinating one, uh, covering multiple states and involving manhunts, shootouts, murders, and love affairs. I don't know how I've never heard of this woman, but it, it, it's going to be a it's going to be a, a fascinating uh, program, I'm sure. So I hope you'll you'll join us on on August 6th um, for uh, really a, a presentation on an obscure uh, figure in Kansas City's crime history. Uh, you know, someone that's not so obscure in our city's history is Henry Perry. Uh, Perry is the undisputed father of Kansas City's barbecue tradition, with both Arthur Bryant's and Gates tracing their roots to the city's original barbecue king. Considering Perry's high standing among Kansas City's barbecue giants, there's been relatively little research of his life and legacy in recent decades. Utilizing digitized newspapers and research tools, local historian Michael Sweeney set out to learn more about the legend who once walked and smoked meats among us. Sweeney is an independent researcher, writer, and archivist who has worked for several cultural heritage institutions, including the uh, National Archives, American Jazz Museum, Black Archives of Mid-America, and the library's own Missouri Valley Special Collections located right across the hall from this auditorium. From 2017 to 2021, he coordinated the State Historical Society's planning and, and initiatives commemorating Missouri's 2021 bicentennial year. In that role, he traveled extensively throughout the state, working with communities to help develop and promote bicentennial projects. For the past two years, Sweeney has served as an in independent archives consultant, working on projects with his alma mater, the University of Kansas, as well as the State Historical Society of Missouri. During that time, he's also been researching Kansas City's barbecue history. An article he authored about Henry Perry will be published in Missouri Historical Review in early 2024, so be on the lookout for that. We're thrilled to have Michael here today to discuss his research. Please join me in welcoming Michael Sweeney. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, tell you a little bit about what I've learned about Henry Perry over the last eight years or so. Um, it's kind of a long, long-term project for me, and I'll talk a little bit about why that's been and whatnot. But we're here um, almost three years to the day to the proclamation of Henry Perry Day, uh, which the city of Kansas City and the county, uh, Jackson County, uh, proclaimed on July 3rd, 2020, which was the 100th anniversary of a free barbecue that Perry had given to women and children and the needy. Uh, just one example of his philanthropy. It was an opportunity to commemorate the man, but also with the help of the Kansas City Barbecue Society, pulled together local, local barbecue establishments, Jones Barbecue, I think Zarda, uh, Oklahoma Joe's, which I will continue to call Oklahoma Joe's until I feel yeah. over. Um, we're all there putting meals together and getting those distributed out to the needy, right? So it was this wonderful occasion. Um, proclamations were issued by Mayor Lucas and, and Jackson County Executive Frank White, um, giving you the story of Henry Perry, right? And the story of Henry Perry, as told in these proclamations, kind of comes down to these main points. One, Henry Perry uh, came to Kansas City in 1907, was the first person to be commercially successful selling barbecue. Number two, that when Perry died in 1940, Charlie Bryant inherited the business, and that's how we got to Arthur Bryant's. Third, that a gentleman named Arthur Pinkard uh, who had been a Perry employee taught George Gates, and that is how we ended up with Gates Barbecue. And number four, that today's barbecue restaurants in Kansas City continue the Perry tradition. 
That's the Henry Perry story as told in those proclamations. Um, but actually, it's a story that's been repeated quite a, for quite a while. Um, so 2014, right, Barbecue Hall of Fame there and um, the American Royal um, inducted Henry Perry in, into their, into the, the Hall of Fame there. Um, and the story they tell is pretty much the same story. Um, their story, you know, hits on coming in 1907, you know, uh, being the first to be su uh, commercially successful. Um, Charlie Bryan inheriting the business. They kind of miss the, the Gates piece, but talk about the long legacy that then Perry is, has had. Um, so I was working at the Black Archives when this was going on, and they called the Black Archives and said, hey, what do you have on Henry Perry? We need the information yesterday. Um, so right very quickly kind of finding what we could find. Um, all paths seem to lead back to a 2001 book published by uh, Doug Wargle called The Grand Barbecue. Um, make sure I'm giving you the full title here. The Grand Barbecue, a celebration of history, places, personalities, and techniques of Kansas City Barbecue. Um, every article I was finding, everything was kind of pointing back to Doug Wargle's book. Um, and I looked at this and went, how is it at this point that we don't know more? <laughs> Um, how has this story never been updated? Um, you know, being in the history field, right, we have new tools that are coming out all the time that help us dig a little bit deeper to understand a little, you know, better. Um, and no one has sort of stepped up and, and done this. So as time went on and other projects developed, I kind of slowly just kept pulling stuff together for Henry Perry. Because again, I was curious, how do we not know more? Um, and over a course of about eight years of doing this, I finally came to a place where it was time to stop. <laughs> and see if we could put some, some pieces uh, together. Um, <clears throat> right, so defining the problem is really about why do we not know more and how, how do we go about finding more. Um, as I mentioned, the tools have changed, right? Um, Doug Wargle will be the first to tell you that he is not a historian, um, that um, you know, the tools were not necessarily available that we have today. I can't just, he could not just punch in Henry Perry into the Kansas City Star database and watch all the articles pop up, right? Um, Ancestor, I think, was still in its infancy when Doug Wargle published his book. Um, so all of these things are now available. What can these kinds of things tell us? Um, so that is what my talk is about today, is kind of what I have found over, those, over that period of time. Um, I do want to do some quick thank yous. Uh, one, to Missouri Valley Special Collections, Jeremy and the staff there who are out of sight, and you all need to give them a hand because they are just a wonderful institution in town. And I'm grateful for their help. I'd like to talk, uh, thank Dr. Andrea Broomfield, who wrote the great Kansas City food biography, excellent food historian. Um, Bernetta McKendra, um, Henry Perry's granddaughter, who has given very freely of her time and has listened to me babble on about this over and over again. I am exceedingly appreciative. Jill Silva, uh, food writer, is working on her own barbecue project at the moment. And Doug Wargle, who is also very kind, to tell me about how his book came together and kind of what were some of the things he was dealing with. Uh, finally, I need to thank my wife, Erica Massa, who very kindly listened to me babble on about this for years and years and years. Um, so, with those thank yous in mind, we got one more thing to do before we get started. Uh, one, some preliminaries. Number one, I am not a food historian. I am not a food writer. I am not a foodie. I have a very unsophisticated palate. So, what's going to happen here is largely biography and business history. <clears throat> okay? Number two. I am speaking in terms of minimums, and here's what I mean by that. I can tell you for sure that Henry Perry gave a free barbecue in 1920. I can tell you he did one in 1921. He might have done more, but I can tell you he at least did these two. So keep that also in mind. I, I have what evidence provides me, and the evidence doesn't provide everything. Uh, number three, there are limits to my knowledge as there are to everyone's knowledge, and that's an exciting thing. My hope is that after this, someone comes behind me and does it better, does it differently, finds even more tools, and keeps this going. Um, it's also an understanding about a lack of evidence. There's things I'd love to know, but there's some things we're just never going to know. The last one, and I want to make sure we're very clear on this, is I feel the more I've talked about this um, in, in, in asking any questions about the Henry Perry story, that somehow I am here to dethrone the barbecue king. I am not here to dethrone the barbecue king. I hope by the end of this talk, you will understand, I think there's good reasons we call Henry Perry the father of Kansas City Barbecue. Um, I think hopefully what I've done is provide a little more evidence for why I think that is the case. So, we all on board? Yeah. Awesome, okay, here we go. Uh, we're gonna head on, head on down the path here. Okay, so, let's see where we make this go. There we are. So, 
facts about Henry Perry's life prior to his arrival in Kansas City are sketchy at best. We're very lucky, though, because Henry Perry gave at least three interviews during his lifetime that provide actually lots of great detail uh, about his early life. One in 1911 with the Kansas City Star, uh, one in 1932 with the call, and then one in 1939 with the call. So these interviews and other newspaper accounts of Perry's activities kind of fill in some of the details. Um, but what we can say is Perry was born March 16, 1874 in Shelby County, Tennessee. <clears throat> to give you a sense of where that is, Memphis is the county seat for Shelby County. Excuse me. <clears throat> okay. And the date for that, for his birth, comes from his World War I draft card um, and his death certificate. So that's where that date is, is coming from. And so Perry learned to cook as a teenager, uh, learned to barbecue as a teenager in Shelby County and honed those skills on those Mississippi riverboats that were going up and down the Mississippi. Um, where he was there, you know, as he told the, the, the call, you know, I was there cooking for entire crews of steamboat, you know, folks. And then when railroad kind of became the big thing, he was cooking for all those folks too on the dining cars. Um, Andrea Broomfield mentions how, you know, Kansas City was this major railroad hub. And the railroad companies were placing ads for, you know, looking for cooks and waiters, promising good wages, great working conditions. Uh, and Perry may have been one of those people who kind of, all of that. Uh, it may have been very much why he ended up in, in Kansas City. Um, that arrival in 1907 is a date he states over and over again. Uh, so I feel pretty good about that. But there is a problem sort of like trying to find Henry Perry once he gets here. Um, city directories for 1908, 1909, there are multiple Henry Perrys who are listed as like laborers and this and that. Hard to, hard to pinpoint who our, our Henry Perry is. Um, there's this brief mention in 1910 from uh, the Kansas City Star's reporting on a wreck of the Union Pacific Colorado Limited in January of 1910, and they mentioned Henry Perry, Negro waiter in a dining car from Kansas City, being among the injured, right? Might be our Henry Perry. 1910 City Directory, though, lists Henry Perry as this porter for a guy named James Meany. And uh, this is the person who I, the Jane, um, this is the Henry Perry that I think is our Henry Perry. And what's important about this is this places uh, Henry Perry very close to 6th Street um, and Bank, uh, where, as he, the call mentions in his, uh, his obituary, that Perry conceived the idea of turning his knowledge of barbecued meats into profitable employment. Um, so just kind of tell you where this is now. Sixth Street is about where I-70 passes. Okay, so we're actually really kind of close. Um, and so part of that area is, is still there. Uh, the place where Meany's Saloon is, of course, is, is, is long gone. Um, Adrian Miller wrote a wonderful book called Black Smoke, dealing with sort of the history of, of African-American barbecuers, which I cannot recommend enough, mentions this really important detail about how, you know, often barbecuers would set up in urban common spaces, so in alleys and sidewalks and whatnot. This is likely what Perry was doing, at least when he got started. Um, so he proved wildly successful with his tent and barbecue pit or push cart, I'm not sure maybe what. Uh, but proved wildly successful and decided to start looking for a bigger place to go. And as he said, he moved closer in. And closer in meant the growing black business district down near 18th and Vine. Um, so in 1911, um, that is where the, the Kansas City Star reporter finds him for that interview. Um, January 1911, this is also really important. And again, something Adrian Miller points out. If this is the dead of winter, this means Perry's operating all year long, right? That he is successful enough that he can keep this business going even through the winter months, which are probably pretty lean. Um, so he is not, though, with his tent and pit very long. He very quickly gets to a brick and mortar location. So city directory for uh, 1912 places in like 1512 East 19th Street. By that next year, 1913, he is at 1514. Um, that building seems to have been built based on the building permits in late 1912, early 1913. Um, and it ended up being just one of several retail spots there along East 19th Street on that, on that block. Um, he was kind of gone briefly in 1914, suddenly disappears from this location. He's back with James Meany as a porter. There's actually another barbecue place in that location at 1514 called Hughes and Buckner. But by the summer of 1914, Perry is back. And he is there till 1925. Uh, spends well over, well over a decade in that spot. Um, it's a great location. He is well situated. Um, it's near Vine Street Baptist Church. Ends up being near the Paseo YMCA. He 
He is just down the street from Lincoln High School, Kansas City's um, African American High School. Um, he's it's in a business area. He's near the fire station. He's got a good spot. He's got lots of people coming by. It is an excellent location. Um, and that is where, where Perry establishes himself. What's really neat is the facade, at least, of that building still stands uh, over at 1514. Um, you know, and um, I love the little bit here from the Topeka Plain Dealer. If you want good barbecue meat, don't forget to see the Barbecue King, 19th and Vine Street. He is the authority on barbecue meat and is located in one of the neatest white enameled brick buildings with a big display window loaded with barbecue meats every day. Um, what I love about this building is it's just so distinct. That beautiful white enameled brick, I love driving by it because, I mean, again, it sort of gives you a place. And I think, again, sort of the specialness of, of the block, um, it sort of sets it aside. But it's here, it's in this location that Perry really kind of establishes himself. I, if there is a heyday of, for Henry Perry's career, it is, it is while he is in this, this spot. Um, it's from this location that he hosts those two free barbecues I mentioned in 1920, 1921. Um, he is advertising at this point on both sides of the state line. So he's appearing, he's got ads in the Kansas City Sun, which is a local black paper in, in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, in the Topeka Plain Dealer, in the National Review, which was a local publication, Kansas City, Kansas, dealing with some national issues. Um, so he's, he's going both sides of the state line, which also tells you something about his reach um, from this location. What is interesting, a lot of, of, though, the coverage of Perry, and there ends up being quite a bit, and we'll talk a little bit about that, is there's little to no mention of the food. <laughs> um, there's a few things that end up coming out. Um, you know, he, there's always this mention about, you know, he's using the, um, as the plain dealer says in 1950, only uses corn-fed cattle and lambs and the choice is pork. Um, from advertisements, we know he also served, you know, possum, raccoon, and a few other things, right? Things that though, during the period of the Great Migration and people moving south, um, might appeal to a southern palate. Um, you know, the plain dealer in 1917 also has this little wonderful piece where he goes that they, they talk about how Perry is going to start producing rabbit sausage. That's just one of the things that he has on offer. Um, what is almost completely missing, though, is any talk about the sauce. And years later, right, there's sort of this memory of, of Perry's sauce being fairly hot. Arthur Bryant, in particular, uh, mentioning this. And, and he remembers it as being a combination of paprika and cayenne pepper and salt uh, in a tomato puree, which gave it sort of this orangish hue. Uh, but very hot. Um, the call in 1932 describes it as sort of a Conti sauce where, uh, and that Perry has mixed the hot stuff into. Um, always very spicy. Uh, there is a great, also a great piece in, in the Topeka Plain Dealer during this period um, where they describe, they give this, they print this letter from a guy in Milwaukee, I believe, uh, who says, I had some of your barbecue while you were in town, while I was in town. I would love to have more of this. Please smother it in the sauce. <laughs> I think it will work out okay. Uh, but again, that tells you something really exciting, which is about Perry's reach and the people who are engaging with him. Um, so a little bit about that. It is also in this location, though, that we first run into Charlie Bryant. Um, so Texas native, Charles uh, Lloyd Bryant Jr. He was the oldest of the Bryant siblings. Um, born in March 1892 near Calvert, that's Robertson County, Texas. Um, at the time um, of his birth, and the family were more than likely sharecropping, sharecroppers at the time. At that time, there were only 29% of farmers in Robertson County who owned their own property. The rest were tenant farmers. Um, so as related by the call, um, Charlie Bryan came to Kansas City as a young boy. He was educated in Kansas City schools, worked at various jobs until he became associated with Perry's growing barbecue business. Now, it's unclear exactly when Bryant started with Perry. Um, he was connected to the food industry as early as 1917, um, as per the city directories. Um, when World War I came, he enlisted in the Army, served in the segregated 92nd um, Division uh, in France, worked at a field hospital there. He was discharged uh, in May of 1918, but by the printing of the 1919 city directory, um, Bryant was employed by Perry. Um, listed as a clerk, um, but he's at least, I can tell you, they're attached together then. So I mean, something we, I don't think we've fully known is like, so. We know Charlie Bryant was a student. When was he a student? Um, this is kind of places you, gives you some sense of kind of where and when that was. Um, by 1924, the city directory um, ends up, list, uh, he, he has changed employers by 1924. Um, and the city director shows him working as a waiter uh, for one of the Denty Moore restaurants, which is a local chain of barbecue sandwich shops. I think they had like four around the city at the time. Uh, but that's where he, he ended up by, 19, by 1924. Um, 
The second significant person that's associated with that 1514 uh, address is a Louisiana native Lulu Benford, um, and definitely more significant on a personal level. She was born in Shreveport uh, in 1889, came to Kansas City no later than 1915. She appears in the 1922 city directory as a cook for Henry Perry. Um, the couple married, they had four children together between 1918 and 1924. Come 1925, Perry makes a move. And the move is to Bonner Springs, uh, specifically the Grandview edition, which was the kind of segregated portion of Bonner Springs. Um, he'd had previous engagements with Bonner Springs. To, to be a plain dealer would have these little social bits, and they mentioned several times that Perry vacationed out at Bonner Springs in, I think, 1917, and again in 1919. So he had some association with it. Um, gets out there, and uh, the Topeka Plain Dealer, I love the wording here, uh, the Barbecue King has moved his business to Bonner Springs, it's about a fine location, uh, also runs a grocery store in connection, his wife on the ground, is on the ground and manages the store. People of both races who know what good barbecue meat is lamenting his going. Uh, he's a high class Christian gentleman and has made a wonderful success for himself. Um, now, this does not last long, um, come July 1926, the Topeka Plain Dealer is very happy to report <laughs> that the people of Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri, uh, and for miles around, are proud of the return of Henry Perry, the barbecue king, who went to Modern Springs to locate. Uh, Perry says he came back a wiser man, and if the Lord will forgive him, he will never be found around Bonner Springs again <laughs> trying to do business. Um, so there is, the, there is this period. Um, Henry Perry comes back. Lulu Perry continues to live in Bonner Springs, run the grocery store, and raise the girls. Um, so when he gets back um, to Kansas City, he has this period of pretty significant expansion. When he gets back, he sets over up at, at 1403 East 17th Street. Um, and it's kind of right near the intersection of Virginia Street. Uh, but from there, at least I kind of quickly expanded. So opened up a place at 1704 East 14th Street. And he had the place at 1627 East 19th Street which I think is the location that is the one we most often associate with Perry, I think, because we have this 1940 tax assessment photo, so we see, right, the building there. Uh, but late 1920s, he's, he's operating all three of these locations. Um, the thing about operating three locations, it means that he obviously had more than himself running the place, <laughs> right? So he had probably had multiple employees um, who were there learning the craft, uh, learning how to barbecue the Perry way. Uh, we don't necessarily know who those folks were, but I think, again, it opens up this really interesting like avenue for exploration um, to find out kind of how Perry's influence kind of expanded out um, into the Kansas City area. Um, that's 1403 address though is the one that he considered was considered his central location um, at the time. Um, Perry's fortunes changed significantly in 1930. Um, in February he has a stroke that year. Uh, spent a month in Bell Memorial Hospital over there on the Kansas City, Kansas side. Um, according to the newspapers, the stroke left Perry uh, paralyzed on his right side, completely preventing him from using his right arm and leg. Um, while he was laid up in the hospital, his home, because by this time he had actually moved his residence to that 1627 East 19th Street address, um, his home had been robbed of clothes and food and whatnot. Uh, by the time he got back in mid-March, he was still in a wheelchair, but by May, uh, the Kansas City American, um, local black uh, paper. Um, often, if you're not familiar with it, it's kind of, it was a rival to the call. If the call was the Republican paper, the American was the Democratic leaning paper. Um, but the American, you know, says, you know, Perry's back at work with the help of an assistant. Um, during this, this period when um, Perry is laid up, um, the 1704 uh, East 14th Street location, though, continues operating, thanks to Charlie Bryant, uh, who had come back into Perry's employ by 1928. Um, at that point, that, that year, the city directory lists him as a cook for Henry Perry again. Uh, and Brian took over that 14th Street location in the early 1930s. Now, it is not entirely clear when this happened. Um, let me sort of throw out the evidence to you. So um, his obituary uh, in, in the Kansas City Times dates the start of his business to 1929. Um, the city directories for 30 and 31 show Bryant being the proprietor of that 14th Street address. Uh, with Perry at the 19th Street address. Uh, telephone directories do not show it as Charlie Bryant's until like May of 1932, right? So somewhere in here though, this location becomes Charlie Bryant's restaurant. Um, 
Arthur Bryant, and who we'll, we'll speak about here, here soon, didn't arrive until, I think, 19, until, until, until 1931. So he and Arthur Bryant remembers learning from Perry. So again, it's a little unclear as to when exactly this transfer happened. Uh, but Bryant remained at that 14th Street location for the rest of the decade. Um, according to his obituary in the call, um, Bryant distinguished himself from his mentor by conceiving his own formula for a barbecue sauce that spread his fame far as a barbecue band far and wide. Um, though Arthur Bryant remembers it being just as spicy as Henry Perry's. Um, Bryant moved his uh, um, location to 1921 East 18th Street, so sort of right across the street with Euclid, um, about 1939. So, uh, But Henry Perry um, remained at the, this uh, 1627 uh, location for the rest of his life, for the entirety of the, of, of the 1930s. There's some really great things about this photograph. So the photograph is part of the, that wonderful collection of tax assessment photographs that you can find in Missouri Valley Special Collections. Um, there's a few things I really, really love about it that may be hard to see. Um, across the top here, you know, it's Barbecue King, Perry's Barbecue. Um, there appear to be barbecue sauce being sold, which I think is kind of neat. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting is I've mentioned 1627, and that tends to be how the business is identified. The address on the door is 1900 Highland Avenue, just FYI. So you tend to get both of these, both of these addresses for the same location. Um, Sherman Thompson, who went on, of course, had his own chain of uh, barbecue restaurants, uh, came to Kansas City in the early 1930s and described, you know, Perry as being a sort of uh, tall, lean guy. He said he could get a slab of ribs for 25 cents. Uh, no bread, though, uh, but yeah, a little bit about kind of you know, Perry there. Uh, the call in particular kept tabs on Perry, um, interviewed him twice in the 1930s, 1932 and 1939, and Perry also provided them with free barbecue numerous times over the 1930s, in fact, twice in 1932 <laughs> alone. Um, but it's also this period of hardships as well. Um, one of the things you get to see, you see over and over again in the press reports is, you know, Henry Perry has been robbed. Henry Perry has been robbed. Uh, what's interesting is he does fend off at least, I think there was, he was burglarized six times in the 1930s. He fends off two of them because there's these pretty dynamic stories about he is laying in wait. He hears someone outside and he lays in wait and with his shotgun, he sends the, you know, the intruder a run in. Um, two other people sort of come into Perry's life in the 1930s. One is Silas Mills. Um, Call mentions him working for Perry in at least 1939, 1940, uh, though the paper noted that Perry was, had known and employed Mills for, for many years. Um, from Colorado, born in 1880, but did not arrive in Kansas City until uh, 1927. Appears in the 1930 census as being employed in public works. Uh, so he likely didn't come into Perry's employee until after Perry's stroke would be my guess. Uh, the other person who, who gets connected up with Perry here is a woman named Abby Bell Burns. Uh, from Mississippi, she had been a janitor at General Hospital Number no. Two. Uh, what's interesting is she lists 1900 Highland Avenue as her residence in 1934 and 1936. We're going to come back to her because I, she, I, I think, becomes another one of those assistants to Henry Perry, particularly as his health starts to decline near the end of his last half of the 1930s. Um, and that in, indeed happens um, over the course of the 1930s. Henry Perry dies at General Hospital Number no. Two, died of pneumonia, March 22nd, 1940. Um, his body was conveyed uh, to a half-brother down in Osceola, Arkansas, uh, the half-brother duly fair, um, and um, burial location unknown. I'm a genealogist, so I tend to be interested in, like, from cradle to grave uh, kinds of questions, um, and I've not been able to determine a burial location for Henry Perry. Um, I remember, uh, some of you may remember Joe Louis Maddox, who I miss terribly. Um, it was just such a, an inspiration to me. I liked visiting with him about these things. But I remember asking him at one point going, because he was down from in that area. He grew up in Crothersville. Um, and I'm like, surely they didn't just take the body down on a train and just leave it there. And he goes, no, he, Julie Fair probably picked it up, took it to the farm, and he's probably buried on that farm somewhere. Um, I did go down to Osceola, Arkansas, and there is a small African-American cemetery there called Union Valley Cemetery. Um, walked the whole thing. There is a, a burial spot for Julie Fair. Um, did not find a marker for Henry Perry, but also did not find a marker for Julie Fair's wife either. Um, so it, there is some likelihood that that's probably, I would bet, most likely where Henry Perry is buried. Um, so that's kind of you know, the facts as best as I can mention them. Um, we're going to run through this again, though, from a different lens. And this is to sort of think about um, 
Henry Perry, uh, and, this pers and a persona that I think he created. If I can say anything about Henry Perry, he is an excellent businessman who knew how to sell himself and to sell his product, um, I think, in just fantastic ways. Um, very smart in this regard. Um, there's kind of two aspects of this I want to mention. One um, is his relationships that he builds with the local newspapers. Um, primarily Nelson Cruz of Kansas City Sun, who was the editor there, uh, Nick Childs uh, with the Topeka Plain Dealer, and ultimately Chester Franklin over at the Kansas City Call. Um, there's these wonderful articles that get run of um, Henry Perry sort of engaging with these folks. One of my favorite, there's this little write-up about a birthday dinner that Henry Perry throws for his second, uh, 42nd birthday. And it lists off the various people that are at the party, right? And there's some very famous names there. Um, Dr. Tompkins, right, who started Douglas Hospital over in Kansas City, Kansas, was at that party. Nelson Cruz was at that party. Um, doctors, lawyers, those are the people who are showing up for this birthday party, uh, which demonstrates a person well-connected, right? Um, the pictures of Henry Perry we have are not Henry Perry at work, right? He's not in a chef's hat. He is the, he is the epitome of a successful businessman, right? That is how he presents himself. Um, and the Kansas City Sun runs advertisements for Henry Perry consistently through most of his run there of 15, 14. Um, Topeka Plain Dealer also checked in on Henry Perry a lot, right? We were out to see our old friend Henry Perry, the barbecue king of Kansas City. He is still climbing the ladder and going higher and higher each day. Um, would you talk about kind of what's going on with him and the rest. Um, the call, again, would, would check in on him certainly with the interviews, but also printed up an article every time he hosted a barbecue for the call, <laughs> right? Perry was just brilliant in figuring out how best to get his name out there. And I will tell you, I have not, I, it is unprecedented, at least in the rest of the stuff that I've seen. So for a completely different project, um, I've gone through every page of the call from 1919 up to 1944, gone through the Kansas City Sun for its entire run, gone through the Kansas City American for its entire run. No one gets this kind of coverage as a food businessman. It, there's no one like, it, it, there's nothing like, I, at least that I have found. Um, and that's really, really important, I think, for part of Henry Perry's success. Uh, the second piece I want to mention, though, is I think this story that Henry Perry tells about himself. And I mentioned this 1911 interview uh, with the Kansas City Star, uh, which I think you can read two different ways. Um, Star reporter shows up there in January 1911 at the, the tent. Um, and, and we've, we're Kansas City, and it's January, it's cold, right? Uh, but they're out there. Um, the reporter, I think, one reading of this is the reporter is, I think, taking advantage of Perry's, um, trying to showcase Perry's ignorance, right? Uh, he you know, shows the sign, and Henry is spelled H-E-N-R-E-Y, and the reporter's like, I'm telling you, that is exactly how it was spelled on the sign, that's not me. I think another reading of this is Henry Perry playing the reporter <laughs> and using this opportunity to tell a story. And there's three pieces of this story. One is this idea of what is a barbecue king? And right, so, so what does a barbecue king have to do anyhow? Uh, Caller to Henry's tent asked the other day. He's got to barbecue any kind of meat better than anybody else. That's what he's got to do. And I ain't lost my title yet. Um, part of the coverage that you end up seeing in the newspapers talks about, I think, the wide success and, and reach of Perry's customers. Um, you see it across class lines. You see it across racial lines. You see it across regions. Again, he is Kansas and Missouri. And then we got things like this letter from Milwaukee of people who know Perry's name. Um, and using that as evidence of a kind of doing it better than anyone else. The other thing that comes up in interviews over and over again is barbecuing, not just the standard things we think about, right, pork, ham, beef, but any kind of meat there possibly could be. Um, in this 1911 interview, he talks about like oysters as being a thing that he will barbecue, right? He can do it. He can do anything you put in front of him. Um, I think the second part of, of this persona is this idea about fidelity to method. Right, um, you'll hear over and over again in these interviews that there is only one way to barbecue and it is the way Henry Perry is doing it. Uh, anything else, you're not doing it right. And the Henry Perry method is to, you know, sort of, is a very slow uh, smoking of the meats um, over on a grate, wood, so, wood is your, being your fuel source, letting those juices sort of drip down onto the wood so there's sort of this cycle going on. Um, there's a great, in, in one of the interviews where Perry goes, yeah, those folks showing up with like the ovens, telling me, hey, I could do it faster. I could do it better if I do the ovens. He goes, 
There's only one way to do this, and it's my way. And he is consistent about that the entire entirety of his life. Um, the third piece of this, though, is probably, I think, the most important, and I think it's this idea of calling. Um, the interview in 1911 concludes with Perry going, you know, this barbecuing is basically our right. My, my tr main trouble with being the barbecue with the barbecue is it's too confining. There's lots of times I just want to throw up my hands and quit altogether and get me a job for you know eight or ten dollars a week, but I can't stay away from it. Every time I drift back to this little old tent, start a fire under some kind of meat, you know, it's you know it's this dull season, but I've got to be here. That idea of being called to do the work is this other thing that sort of appears consistently. Um, love this, again, from the Topeka Plain dealer, right? Henry Perry, the barbecue king, who is endowed with the gift to cook meats. Um, it does sort of shift character a little bit uh, in the 1920s, where the language becomes about um, Henry Perry is a businessman first and foremost. He is businesslike at all times. Um, he is dedicated to the, there's no time for taking time off. There is, I, I am here doing this thing. I have committed. Um, the, and then it kind of changes character again in the 30s, where it becomes the story of perseverance, right? Of a guy who's been crippled by a, by a stroke, but he is soldiering on, right? Um, and when he is facing the rubbish, right? He is there fighting them off, right? There is this, I think, this idea that of total dedication to the craft of being a true barbecue man, if you will. And I think these things, you know, kind of all wrapped up together give you this persona of who Henry Perry is. Um, and that thing about perseverance, I think in particular, is the one that really stands out for me in, in particular. But, the, but again, these are things he is saying about himself. These are things other people are saying about him, right? And it builds this idea of, I think, this persona of the barbecue king. Um, and uh, so I think that all of this kind of builds towards the story we tell now about Henry Perry, the father of Kansas City Barbecue. Um, so, very famously, Calvin Trillin, uh, New York opinion writer, um, did this article in Playboy in April of 1972, and he says, maybe perhaps tongue in cheek, but it's long been acknowledged that the single best restaurant in the world is Arthur Bryan's Barbecue at 18th and Brooklyn in Kansas City. Um, the Playboy article basically tries to make an argument for Kansas City as a culinary capital of, of the world. And basically, he uses Arthur Bryan's as Exhibit A. Um, it recounts this conversation, right? He goes to, he goes to Bryant's with his friend, uh, an attorney, Marvin Rich, and they sit down. They get to talk to Bryant themselves. And um, Bryant you know, basically says, listen, yo, Brian told us he and his brother learned everything they knew about barbecuing from a man named Henry Perry who originated barbecue in Kansas City. He's the greatest barbecue man in the world, Brian said. It was a mean outfit. Um, Perry used to, you know, he goes on about kind of the sauce and this whole idea of, of you know, how spicy it is, and then Perry was taking joy in seeing that. But, um, but this idea that, oh yeah, Henry Perry is the guy you need to be paying attention to. Um, Trillin ends the article in this really interesting way. He, he imagines this conversation. He imagines going before the city council and the mayor and saying, hey, what about Henry Perry? And they're like, do you mean Commodore Perry? Like, no, Henry Perry, who brought barbecue to Kansas City. And kind of this idea, and they have no idea who he is, right? And Trillin's like, oh, you, you built a statue of this guy or something. But yeah, they don't know who he is. Um, and right here in 2023, I think we can say that is not the case. Uh, right? If you get a Wikipedia article, if you have a day uh, commemorating you, if I think about Mackenzie Martin's award-winning podcast on Perry, um, I think it's fair to say that Perry is fairly well known at this point. Um, but how really do we kind of know, why, why do we know this story at all? Um, you know, the Grand Barbecue, I said, I think ends up being this major source in 2001. There was an earlier work uh, from 1985 called Bar All About Barbecue, Kansas City Style by Sharifa Stein and Rich Davis, Rich Davis being the creator of the KC Masterpiece, right, barbecue sauce. Um, it's the first instance I ever found, the first instance I ever found Perry being referred to as father of Kansas City barbecue comes from a review of that book from 1985. That's the first time I ever see that actually mentioned um, as, a, as a thing. Um, and their book in particular really kind of traces Perry to Bryant and kind of skips out on the gate piece. I'll tell you a little bit about that, why in just a minute. But, um, so there is kind of this lineage, but at the end of the day, I would say that if there's any reason we still know about Henry Perry, it's because of Arthur Bryant and the role that Henry Perry ends up telling uh, you know, for, for him. Um, having said that, um, and before we talk about Bryant, 
I've already mentioned some other people who had been engaged with Henry Perry, right? And I think we often forget about them. <laughs> Henry Perry's influence is far beyond Bryant's. Um, I mentioned Abby Burns, so I can't tell you much about this other than 1941, so the year after Perry dies, she is listed as the proprietor of the Henry Perry Barbecue Restaurant. It only lasts all of a year, from what I can tell, but in some ways, she ends up receiving that business. Um, Silas Mills um, goes on and launches his own place, strikes out on his own in 1942, uh, opens a stand at 2013 East 12th Street, partnered um, with a former Pullman porter named Benjamin Tillery, and they operated the business's M&T Barbecue. But again, he pushes his association, right? Silas Mills, associated with Perry the Barbecue King. Right, come see us. Um, and this business lasts until, I think, um, Mills dies in 48, Tillery dies in, in, in 54, and then Tillery's wife continues the business for a few years more. Um, Retha Jones, interestingly enough, at 1627 East 19th Street, Jones Barbecue, and again, she ties herself to Perry. So this is another person who is associated with Perry, can't tell you when exactly, but come in and try our original Southern barbecue, the finest in the land. Mrs. Jones was with the late Henry Perry, the first barbecue king. His old friends will recognize the true down-home flavor, and our new friends will appreciate the same. Um, her business, unfortunately, does not last long. She's basically there 48, 49. By 1950, that location becomes an auto repair shop. Um, and finally, and probably most important, is Lulu Perry Hall, um, who continued to operate the grocery store and the barbecue stand in Grandview. Um, you know, she raised the girls. She remarried to a guy uh, named uh, Robert Hall, who was a Florida native. Um, the family lore very much attests to her business acumen. She was great on the business end. Um, able to and really sort of keep the barbecue place going. Um, interestingly enough, she also very, very much valued that tie to Henry Perry um, and what that relationship meant to her. Throughout her life, she was Lulu Perry Hall. Um, there's a great little note on the 1950 census uh, where the census takers, yes, she insists on using her maiden name, which for, in this case, was going to be Perry. Um, she died in Kansas City, Kansas in, in uh, November of 1958. I would be really curious. It would be great to investigate how close to the original Lulu Perry Hall did it. Of the people, I would, I would assume that she would be the one who would change the recipe the least and have that go as far as it does. Um, but so we got other people, right, who are sort of involved in this. But Arthur Bryant outlasts them all, right? As the other students of Henry Perry passed in the scene, Arthur Bryant remained and publicly kept that Henry Perry story alive. So um, Arthur was the youngest. If Charlie was the oldest, Arthur was the youngest of, of the, the Bryant siblings. Uh, graduated from Prairie View A&M in spring of 1931. Planned a trip west to go see a cousin out in California. Stopped in Kansas City to see his brother and just never left. Um, let's hear the rest of his life. Uh, with Charlie's help, he got a job with Henry Perry. Uh, and, uh, Arthur says that at 14th Street location, um, he said, you know, 20-hour days were not unusual, which if you're attending a pit, that's true, right? You're at it all the time. Um, continued on with Charlie when, he, when Charlie eventually took over that location. Except for a few years where Arthur was operating a service station over on 19th Street, he remained a barbecue man the rest of his life. Um, as Charlie Bryan's health started failing, Arthur bought the business in 1946. Um, Charlie Bryant ultimately passed away in October of 1952. It is not until 1954, though, that it becomes Arthur Bryant's barbecue. Um, remained in that building at, at 18th and Euclid for quite a while until 1959 when it was uh, bought and then raised for uh, urban renewal. And that is when he moved to that location that we, we know as Arthur Bryant's now over on Brooklyn. Um, you know, over the years, Bryant consistently traced the origins of his method and business expertise to Perry. Um, and kind of and keeping that legend of the barbecue king alive while also positioning himself, um, you know, as part of this, this living legacy. This thing about, you know, um, I am tied with Perry, but this is what I did differently. I have this authentic thing. This is where I, I you know, changed things up. I made innovations. Um, interestingly enough, I mentioned Calvin Trill, and that's the person we tend to celebrate about, oh, you know, really putting Bryant's on the map out there. But actually, Bryant had been telling this story long before Calvin Trill showed up. Uh, the earliest interview I saw with him was in 1966, and he was telling this exact same thing he said to Calvin Trillin, which is, I learned everything I knew from Henry Perry. My brother learned everything he knew from Henry Perry, and I have followed in that tradition. The things that he says he changed is always the sauce. Because again, and then I got this, Adrian Miller really pushes this, but this idea about your sauce being your signature, right? So that Arthur Bryan spends time talking about the sauce it should not surprise anyone, right? It's the thing that sets him aside. And I think also pushing this idea that somehow Paris was, sauce was so super hot that it made people frown. I have a hard time believing this, that you would be this successful in business 
if that was the case. But by pushing that, right, it's like, this is what I did differently. I learned from the master, this is how I moved it in, in other ways. Um, near the end of his life, you know, uh, Brian sat for another interview with the Kansas City Times, and the reporter goes, Brian bears the stamp of another time when shops and eateries were like tailored suits, bearing indelibly the stamp of one man's personality. You know, and Brian ends the interview going, you know, I'm my own barbecue man. I got men doing the cooking, but I got a supervisor, it wouldn't be nothing. But that whole idea of being a personality tied to a restaurant, I mean, again, I think it does tie back to this Henry Perry bit. The idea of Henry Perry and who Henry Perry is and his stamp on this thing is a large part of that success, right? And, and being able to, again, that is, I think, just being a really good businessman. So Arthur Bryan dies at his Brooklyn uh, restaurant there in December of 1982. Um, the other person who comes up, though, um, is Arthur Pingard, um, who Warhol calls the mystery man uh, in his book. Um, he interviews um, Ollie Gates and his mother, um, Ms. Arzelia Gates, uh, about kind of the history of the Gates barbecue um, empire and asks them the question, you know, it's my understanding that George Gates learned from Henry Perry. I'm like, no, 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 not true. He learned from a guy named Arthur Pinkert, who had been an employee of, of Perry's, uh, which really is the first time that this connection is, is made, is in that, um, that interview and, and, and in the book. Uh, they don't remember much about it. Pinkert. Pinkert was a fairly old man at the time when they got the restaurant, uh, but he was kind of a fixture there. But again, some digging shows that Arthur Pinkert, Alabama native, born in Phoenix City, Alabama in 1880, uh, came to Kansas City around 1917, had been employed as a cook over at the Al Cafe, which was at 21st East, um, on 24th Street, uh, at least from 1917 to 1921. Um, directories list him as a cook in 1922 and 24, but don't really provide an employer, so I can't tell you exactly where he was. Uh, 25 to 30, I completely lost the man when it came to city directories. Uh, partly because of his name, um, it is spelled in so many different ways I have found. Uh, Pincard, P-I-N-C-A-R-D, Pinker, P-I-N-K-E-R-T-T, P-I-N-K, Pink, um, Pinkard, P-I-N-C-K-A-R-D, um, which I think may lead to some of the difficulties. Uh, at least in the 1930s though, he is out of the food industry and is working as a janitor at two different apartment complexes. Uh, the 1940 census shows him working for WPA, but that's when he kind of switches back to um, the food industry. And he takes a job um, at Old Kentucky Barbecue, Old Kentucky Barbecue on 2331 Forest Avenue. Um, at that time, he was married, so a wife, um, Ella, they had a, he had a, this is a stepson, uh, Andrew. So, right, he had a family. Um, so, Kentucky Barbecue, as a business, had been around at least since 1927. They're on 2331 Forest Avenue. A um, gentleman named John C. Thomas, Johnny, Johnny Thomas, uh, purchased that business in 1941 um, and started operating it as Old Kentucky Barbecue. He moved the business by the end of that first year to 19th and Vine, um, which in, in a very confusing manner had also been called Kentucky Barbecue, also sometimes called Kentucky Paradise. Um, so to make matters even more confusing, the Kentucky Barbecue location on Forest Avenue continued to operate as Kentucky Barbecue under new ownership. So there were three of these things um, that you kind of have to go keep track of. But when Johnny Thomas moved to that location, he took Arthur Pinker with him. So when George Gates and his partner, uh, John Hudspeth, bought it in 1946, it bore a little resemblance to the Gates Barbecue we kind of know about uh, today. Um, Ollie Gates in one interview reminisced years later, described Old Kentucky Barbecue as a type of speakeasy and after hours facility. Uh, he said people would come in about 1.30 a.m. when the taverns closed, and that's when our business commenced. Um, we talked about them selling setups, right? They, they didn't sell liquor, but they sold basically the cups, the ice, <laughs> the soda to go with it. Um, Arzelia Gates um, shifted the focus away from the booze. Um, Ollie Gates explained in one interview, my mother, being the moral person she is, decided the whiskey would have to go. Uh, which, you know, and, and I'm so grateful she did, because then we have the great barbecue um, chain that we, you know, and restaurant and empire that we have today. Um, Pinkard, however, I will say, like I said, was kind of came with Old Kentucky Barbecue when, when Gates bought it. And that is how Gates learned, um, learned the barbecue business. Um, he had become a feature at Old Kentuck. Um, sadly, his wife died there in 1941 at that location. She had a cardiac episode. Um, but he had been there, you know, quite a long time. Um, Gates obviously found Pinkard to be an asset, not only teaching uh, George Gates how, how to barbecue, but also putting him in the advertisements, right? Old-fashioned barbecue that can't be beat, cooked by the oldest barbecue man in Kansas City, Arthur Pinkard. 
Um, that is a name that mattered um, to folks, that they would draw people in. Um, there was a fire in 1951 that destroyed um, Old Kentuck Barbecue, and it ultimately moved to 20, 24th and Brooklyn. Um, that locates that first time. Uh, Pinkard remained with Gates until about 1954, moved to St. Louis, and died there in, in February of 1963. Gates' family has never forgotten Arthur Pinkard. Um, in many of those restaurants, when you walk in the door, you will see a framed picture of him in the doorway, um, which is where I took that one. It's been a public part of the Gates story, at least since 1977. Um, the first appearance of Arthur Pinkard's name in, in Can't Say Star and Times is in a profile of, of Gates Barbecue by uh, Susan Forscott, and she notes the photograph on the wall and sort of who this is. Um, interestingly, she does not mention Henry Perry, though. That connection seems to have come from Wargle asking a question, um, and that's sort of how we know that piece. Um, so that's about the legacy part, kind of how, I think how we got this story of Henry Perry, father of Kansas City Barbecue. I think it's well earned, but it has a history to it. Um, one of the things I'm hoping that this has done is not to, again, I think this, the, the facts remain. I think Henry Perry is the first person to have commercialized barbecue in Kansas City. I think he had a huge wide reach, wider than I think we think, far beyond Bryant and Gates. Um, and I think that's a way to sort of rethink this story just a little bit. Uh, if I had uh, the time, the money, and all the rest, it's time to erect the plaque here. <laughs> uh, this is, and this is what I think I should say, right? Tennessee native Henry Perry arrived in Kansas City in 1907, known as the Barbecue King for over 30 years. Perry served barbecue meets to people throughout the region, building a reputation that crossed racial and class lines, a model of black entrepreneurship, Perry gave back to the community through philanthropy and mentorship of black women and men in the barbecue business who continued his tradition of culinary excellence. Today, Arthur Bryant's Barbecue and Gates Barbecue continue to follow the Perry method of preparing barbecued meats with sauces that give each their unique signature. Perry, the first person in Kansas City to succeed at making a living by barbecuing, set the standard and continues to inspire others seeking to build businesses and advance the craft of barbecuing. Um, I don't know how much longer, I mean, there's lots of development going on down at 18 and Vine, which is very exciting. Um, I hope we don't lose this location. I, I just, for a city that so prides itself on its barbecue, if there's a cradle of Kansas City barbecue, it is here. Um, I would say the flip side, side of that sign should say, you know, it's here that Charlie Bryant learned how to barbecue. It is here on that block where Arthur Pinker taught George Gates how to do the business. It is here that Oswald Bartlett, right, um, had Dixieland barbecue for years. This is an important spot in Kansas City's barbecue history. Man, just, um, I'm gonna wrap up here really quickly, because um, I think my journey with Henry Perry is coming to its conclusion. But there are lots of other great things to investigate, and I hope someone will pick up some of these things. One is just basic business history. Um, who are Perry's competitors? You might remember back early slides, that little city direct, that little directory showed Perry at that location. There were two other barbecue places listed on it in 1914. One, very interesting, a guy named Richard Alexander, who was one of the first black police officers in Kansas City, but his second career was as a barbecue man. Um, and there's numerous articles about him. Um, one of the things I did as part of this was to try and come up with, like, I was curious about who his competitors were. And so I started going through the city directories basically from 1910 to 1916, found every barbecue place I could find, anybody I could find associated with barbecue, um, went through the newspapers, every advertisement I could find, developed a list of about 600 businesses, both sides of the state line, some lasting such a long time um, that I think, again, could use some, some depth and, and some understanding. Um, grants over in Kansas City, Kansas, were there for over 40 years. Um, Blender's Barbecue, also around well over 40 years. <laughs> Some of these places were around for a very, very long time. Um, they may not have lasted like Arthur Bryan did, so they're not there to tell their story. But it'd be great to figure out, as part of our landscape, who are these folks? Um, you know, interesting, I, I started trying to figure out um, where did people come from, right? So basic genealogy thing, right? They come from Alabama, the Tennessee, Texas. Where's the where are those flavors being brought in from? Um, you can start piecing some of these little things together by grabbing all the data points. Um, so I think that's one. I think thinking about our Paris of the Plains image and the where barbecue fits into that, you'll find numerous articles about you know, barbecue connected with gambling, with dance halls, with liquor sales, <laughs> and all the rest. But right, it's a part of that story. It's part of our Paris of the Plains bit. I think most importantly, connections across the state line. 
our, I think it's a huge mistake. We tend, if you're on the Missouri side, you tend to focus on we're doing Kansas City, Missouri. If you're on Kansas side, we're doing Kansas City, Kansas. I already drove across that state line twice today. Yeah. Um, we, people move back and forth all the time. We need to start thinking about this as a much more regional thing. And obviously, as I mentioned, Henry Perry was advertising on both sides of the state line. Um, I think that's a way to think about it. Also, just our basic racial and ethnic history in Kansas City, about the people who were involved in barbecue. African Americans were the vast majority of those business owners. Um, but also immigrants. Lots of great immigrant stories here. Right? Julius Blender, who I mentioned, was from Russia. Uh, you know, Russian, Russian Jewish heritage. Um, and there's quite a, there's a number of those. Gentleman in Elbury, Kansas City, Kansas, Nick, I'm gonna mispronounce his last name, I'll say Bacalus, was from Turkey, <laughs> right? Had a huge, a long career. Um, how do these people impact the story we're telling? Uh, finally, women. Oh my gosh, the number of women business owners that I'm stumbling into as I was going through the competitors. We don't talk about them. But they were here too, right? And how does that change the way we think about our barbecue story here in Kansas City? And finally, I think it's also this question about origin stories and why we decide to call ourselves a barbecue town. I went and looked at like the Convention and Visitor Bureau guys from like the 70s and early 80s. They didn't talk barbecue, they talked fine dining. We were a cattle town, um, right? So when did we become this barbecue town that we celebrate? And what is that about? And what does it say about us? And what does it say about what we share, about the things that divide us, and the goodness that I think can come from that story? Um, I think those are all great avenues for exploration. Um, so with that, I appreciate your time. I hope this has been interesting. Um, and uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to entertain a few of them. So. <laughs> if you can, if you want to come up to the microphone, that would be helpful. Since you came in 1907, yeah. between then and 1911, yeah. he became the barbecue king. Did he crown himself? And is that all part of his advertising? Okay, so interesting that, um, and Adrian Miller talks a, a, quite a bit about this. Um, so Miller talks about how Barbecue King in some ways was the equivalent of Pitmaster today. And that more often than not, it was a self-appointed title. Um, so certainly Henry Perry called himself the Barbecue King. I ran into an article and the headline was the death of the Barbecue King. And I'm, it was from 1920, I'm like, what? Different guy, Ollie Harris, the Barbecue King. Uh, Richard Har uh, Alexander that I mentioned early on, uh, the former uh, police officer. One article, the Barbecue King from Kansas City, Richard Alexander. Um, right, so there is a bit of that. It's a mar I mean, in part, it's a marketing tool. Um, I think from the 21st century, right, when we say the bar you know, we talk about the Barbecue King, and again, it's part of the stories we tell about ourselves. It might have been just a self, you know, kind of self-appointed thing earlier. We kind of continue to use that in that celebratory way. Yeah. So one of your first slides, you showed that he was born in the Memphis area. Yeah. Did you find out any information on his folks, what they did, uh, and then does that lead into how, what was his interest in learning how to cook? Excellent question. Um, and the answer is no, I did not, but I will tell you sort of what the avenues are, okay? Uh, partly, you know, is because of slavery and the recording of African American lives in this country. There's some things you don't know. One, so the first census you can come to is the 1881 that he would, he would be on. Um, and I could not find a Henry Perry in Shelby County of the right age in the census. So trying to get to that ends up being a little difficult. The other path though is Dooley Fair, the half brother. Um, and it gives you a mother's name, which is Mamie. And being from Mississippi, um, obituary also mentions a, a half sister living in Mississippi. So that's kind of the other path back, but I've not necessarily been able to, to do that. Michael, in your, in your research, um, we know the, the, the Perry lineage. Have you found examples of former uh, students, if you want to call them that, of, of his that opened up restaurants in other states outside of no, KCK? Or Excellent, excellent question. And I think there is sort of that deeper delving. And I think, well, I will say this, Jeremy, the other thing that may help in this, I mentioned that big old spreadsheet, and you've, you've watched me, God bless you all, in Missouri Valley as I poured over city directories over and over again. So kind just to let me do it there in the back. Um, right, you start building some data points and seeing if you can find names and finding origins and finding, and you start trying to pick pieces together. So while the answer is no right now, 
I would be surprised if there wasn't. And again, that continued digging, right, this continued pulling together what seemed like disparate data points together might help answer that question. You made me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm going to ask you kind of a loaded question. Okay. Where do you enjoy going to eat barbecue? It changes all the time. Oh, well, give me two, three, two or three. My favorite right now is Slaps. Oh, yeah. Over in Kansas City, Kansas. Strawberry Hill neighborhood. That's, that's right. That's my favorite right now. <laughs> it changes. Yeah, uh, the, the flavor for profile, uh, uh, for, for those of you that have eaten at Arthur Bryant's currently, is pretty distinctive. It's, a, it's definitely an acquired taste. I don't know if many of you remember that jar yeah. that sat in the window when it was 150 degrees. And people would go, uh, we're not eating this from there, are we? Uh, he also had an employee named Richard. Yeah, Richard Who was 17 feet tall. <laughs> and when he put sandwiches together, I had a friend from New York that came in and he said, I never saw the guy. I thought he was making sandwiches with his feet. Yeah. And, uh, but that flavor profile, uh, I think everybody would like to know, and, and, and uh, you know, Slaps is great, but uh, the, uh, I used to be a food editor for Kansas City, the bullshit. Uh, I was their sauce meister. And I, uh, people from all over the country would send me their sauces and how, it, how they got the sauces together. It was some grandmother's recipe. And, and I would, I'd go to Boston. I flew all over the country and met with these people. But if, if we were to experience Henry Perry's uh, craftsmanship early on, I, I would assume, and there's a, there's a distinct connection between Gates and the, the, the original Arthur Bryant's. Mm -hmm. Uh, and of course, Arthur Bryant's has come out and made more user-friendly sauces. You know, the sweet heat's fantastic, but it's been modernized. But if we were to want to experience Henry Perry's kind of original flavor profile, the original Arthur Bryant's sauce would probably be that, would it not? I, uh, I would say I don't know, and here's why I say that. Because it's very, Arthur very Bryant, unique. But yeah. Arthur Bryant made such a big deal out of doing the sauce differently. Really? Right? Okay. I, but it is a consistent thing where it's like, and again, I think he's overstating it for the very purpose of let me tell you what I did differently. But this idea that, you know, I, he, I think I showed you the slide where he's like talking about, oh yeah, you know, it was so hot and people would grimace and Perry took delight in seeing those grimaces and I, don't, I want people to come back. Um, and so toning that whole thing. Or right. that Charlie also had like a hotter sauce. Right. So, I mean, that's why I don't know. The one, the, I, the one I would most love to see, and I wish there was more information about, is Lulu Perry Hall. Yeah. And what she was doing. Because like I said, I think that in my mind, and again, I don't know for sure, but my sense is she probably would have changed the least. Yeah. Because yeah. she was there when that yeah. barbecue stand started. Yeah. Um, well, one last thing, and I'll just say this to everybody. Uh, so I, I went to De La Salle High School at 1524 Paseo. Yeah. So I was near this building all the time, yeah. at the parade park and all that. That's what it looks like now. Yeah. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Walt Disney, we, and, and talk to your city council people and ask them the question, what brings people to Kansas City? It's not a, it's not, it's not a filet mignon. It's barbecue. Yeah. And we are doing nothing, nothing to celebrate that. Yeah. And uh, when you're talking to somebody, ask that question. What the hell's going on? Right. That's the bill. That's Kansas City Barbecue? Yeah. It shouldn't be. Yeah. Anyway, I'll leave you with that. But thank, thank you, you very much. Yeah. Hi. Hi. My question is. Oh, oh, there we are. There we go. My question is. You're good. I got you. Can you hear me? I got you. Okay. My question to you is, what made you interested in this piece? And how have you um, used this in your everyday life? Oh, okay. Um, so one was just the sheer curiosity of why don't we know more when we should know more. Um, I had been at the Black Archives probably about a year by that point, and 
my work at the Black Archives, I think, I hope, I hope has been the case, that um, everyone should be allowed to tell their stories. And I'm very privileged. As a white cis male, I got all the records I need in the world to tell my story. So how do you figure out ways to get other people to tell their stories? So for the most part, I held off any opportunities to like, actually investigate the history of money really interesting. And so that's been kind of an, an ongoing curiosity I've had that I felt I finally needed to do something with. In terms of how it affects me on a daily basis, I think like, two things. The other project I'm working on, and it may be a connection here, is about you, Oliver Cook, who was principal of Lincoln High School, longest serving principal there. And I think the stories that we, however you wanted to find we, right? We talk about Kansas City as being barbecue town. He's our father of Kansas City barbecue, who is the R in this. I think a recognition and a statement of particularly black contributions to our shared story, I think is part of this. It's, I mean, it's, it's kind of a motivator. Um, and I mean, not to get too far into it, you know, I was the child of a police officer <laughs> whose engagement with black folks was never good. And I also went to a Methodist church where Mrs. Washington was always hugging me all the time. And being a studious guy, I wanted to find out what can I know. And so I took African American Studies classes, right, and all the rest. Um, and so it's, I've, I think I've continued this on, this idea of things that aren't my story to tell <laughs> and held back on it quite a ways. But also trying to figure out those opportunities to make those stories not just, oh, that's someone else's story. No, there are shared stories. I have a responsibility to Henry Perry, too, as part of who we are and what we do. I don't know if that quite answered your question, but I hope it, uh, uh, well, anyway. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. My question goes back to the gentleman's point about that building. I'll go down to 18th and Vinyl Lock, and that building has been there for, like that, for decades. Uh, is that part of the city-owned property in the 18th and Vine District? And if so, our city council should get their act together and try to find a solution, because they own a lot of that property and haven't done anything with it. And I, I don't know. I wish I had an answer for you. I yeah. just don't. Mr. Brooks, thank, Afternoon. You, for being, thank you for being here. Let me try to address the gentleman as well as this gentleman, <clears throat> and all of us. I'm old enough to remember when. Yeah. I'm 91 years old, so I remember when. I, I didn't expect that, but thank you. <laughs> um, that property is now owned by a developer named Kelvin Simmons. He's also doing the housing, the uh, high La in 1900 block of Vine. Melissa Robinson, who just got reelected, is the third district in district person council per person. I'm going to assure you and the audience here that I'll be on the phone with both Kelvin as well as uh, Melissa Robinson to remember the history of this building. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. And there is a possibility that the two of them together, he has the money and other developers working with him. The city may want to invest in some, they, that's, that whole L there from Paseo to Vine, 18th and 19th, excluding the, the apartments there as well as the church, uh, is, is all development with cooperation with the city. So I'm hopeful and prayerful after hearing your presentation and the, and the gentleman here and the question here, that there is a possibility that we may do some restoring of that and even get it on the federal register. I appreciate that. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. One, one, last, one last comment, uh, uh, the, the, the nature of barbecue and the association with with uh, perhaps uh, the black folk and white folk. Uh, you had the Philistines and the proletariat. Uh, the proletariat would throw out the tougher cuts of meat, like brisket. I mean, these were things that you don't, I mean, brisket's tough. Uh, for years, no one would eat brisket. It's like chicken wings, they throw them away. And, and the more tender cuts of meat were, were prized and the less tougher cuts of meat were given to the, 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 the Philistines, okay, to figure out. And, and primarily black folk, black folk. And what they learned through slow cooking, and you cook meat 
at, at less than 200, around 220 degrees, because when you go above that, you're boiling the fat inside, and that makes it tough. So you cook it, you know, with, with the flavoring, uh, you know, you, they would get into the BTUs of the, of, of the, of the, of the, of the, the wood that they used. And so that, that you, you cook it so the fat leaves slowly, and that tenderizes the meat. Well, it was the black folk that took those throwaway cuts and made them delicious. So that's how this all happened. And that's a little history on where this meat came from. Because people, you know, nowadays, they want to go out and get a brisket. Well, brisket got thrown in the trash. Just a thought. So. Awesome. Grandma put up the barbecue.